I've had my first sponsorship on the channel. This video was sponsored by Surfshark VPN. More on that later. A shadow looms over the old world. Smog clouds the watchful sky, the stench of death lingers, the fires of war burn evermore, and the iron treads of legions churn the mud of blood-sodden battlefields. They shall not cease in their advance until they raise their towers over every hold, all dissidents quelled by the chorus of harmony, and all that stands between them and total domination are the wicked hordes of chaos. Wait, that can't be right. Surely it's the forces of civilization who have to make their stand against the hordes of destruction- And that's a doomstack. A few, actually. God, they arrived fast. So how did it come to this? Well, I recently became an advisor to Archeon the Everchosen, and he's been asking the same question, as have several other clients I've been working with. Orcs, goblins, vampiric lords of the undead, uh, ratmen, oh, that's just silly, no way those are real. Oh, and the Dark Elves from Canada. And I think the best place to start looking for that answer is in the story of how Warhammer ended on tabletop. The time when all of these guys won. Yeah. Trust me, it's not a good read. Warhammer is a flavor of dark fantasy so pronounced that many other settings have taken notes from it. Its sister franchise, Warhammer 40,000, took the same concept of the stars and saw roaring success as an iconic blend of dystopic fiction and science fantasy. One whose fans went on to invent terms like grimdark just to describe what life is like there. But while 40k has always held strong, fantasy found itself struggling to meet targets and waned in popularity during the early 2010s, so much so that the IP holders, Games Workshop, decided to reboot Warhammer by giving the setting a decisive ending. The End Times is possibly one of the most controversial parts of Games Workshop's history, and that's saying something. People were always going to take issues with the setting ending at all, giving people pour thousands of dollars and hours into the game and learning about its world, but it's widely considered to be a terribly handled way of ending a 30-year flagship franchise, and its depictions of the setting's main characters is embarrassing. For instance, Thorgrim Grudgebearer, the most meticulous motherfucker this side of the World's Edge Mountains, forgets to turn on his anti-backstab runes like Cat forgetting her shields, while others do the most star-screaming of heel turns just to ensure the heroes don't win last second. Manfred! But most of all, it isn't like the essence of the story had to see the world end. Sigmar purifies the lands of the Empire from the rot of Nurgle anyway, a very heavy-handed allegory for the setting getting stagnant, so why does the world have to become a literal clean slate to justify a metaphorical one? All of this, and the discontinuing of model lines to push a new game with a very different appeal, when right around the corner was what may have saved the entire game. About a year later, Total War Warhammer would release to critical and commercial acclaim, even in the face of controversy. A healthy quantity of fresh-faced gamers became fans quickly, bringing new eyes towards the Warhammer IP with tons of tabletop players picking the game up too. Which, let's be real here, it's not like they were left for much else, right? Video games like Vermintide were really the only thing left coming out of OG Fantasy, while coincidentally was also bringing content staff Left 4 Dead fans into the Dark Gods clutches as well. The sequel, which came out only a year later, introduced a new campaign mode which contained the races and locations from both games, to create a truly global conflict to capture the scope of the setting. Mortal Empires. It even contains its own end times crisis, with the forces of chaos hurtling south to crush anyone in their path, but there's one incy-wincy problem of how this is integrated. Total War is a game about building empires, not destroying them. It's a game of conquest, where your neighbor's cities are assimilated into your faction, painted in your colors, and Warhammer doesn't reinvent this part of its gameplay. Chaos and a couple other factions prefer to plunder their surroundings to survive, but even when you do have settlements, you can rarely compete with the gigantic war economies of your opponents who are designed to build civilizations, or prevent factions from taking their lands back. Couple that with the AI deliberately targeting the player, and as early as turn 15 you may find yourself on the wrong end of this. <laughs> this is... This is the early game! Your peasant-based crusade into the chaos waste should be bankrupting you! You get penalties for even settling in this area! What the- <laughs> Why are you doing this? It's times like these I wish I could summon a big sea monster to protect my coastline. <laughs> like that. This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. If there's one complaint I've heard since coming here, it's that everyone's worried about the lack of privacy nowadays. And I can see why. The way personal data is collected by big companies is a huge cause for concern. Luckily, Surfshark keeps you safe online, encrypting information that goes between your device and the internet. If there's one thing I've learned from getting to know the commanders here, it's that the harshest attacks often come when you least expect it. Phishing scams and malicious pop-up ads can be just like a well-placed ambush. But thanks to Surfshark's clean web feature, you can block these before they do harm, and get back to browsing the web safely. 
But that's not all. VPNs are able to swap out your IP address on your device with another from across the world, not only protecting your real IP from potential hackers, but also letting you browse the internet as if you were currently based in that address's country. There's a particular comedian I love watching sometimes called Limmy. He's hilarious, but half of his stuff is blocked on UK YouTube. With Surfshark, I can instantly switch over to an American location and enjoy his good work anytime. Surfshark lets you use this app on any number of devices, including Windows, Android, browsers, and even smart TVs. So whether you're watching this on your desktop at home or from your phone on the bus, why not sign up now? Go to surfshark.deals forward slash thunderpsyker to get up to an additional six months of the service for free when you join. And Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk in giving it a shot. Signing up with a link lets Surfshark know I sent you, so check out the link in the description. With every update came more attempts to make Chaos feel like a threat, sometimes stacking their forces up to a cartoonish degree, yet very little changed. At its worst, the Zardom of Kislev becomes a speed bump, but at its best, could solo Archeon the Never Chosen, and this was before they were even a unique faction. Kislev. But the thing that emasculates Chaos the most isn't the strength of individual armies, but how they operate together. Every one of the major Order factions gains a short buff called the Shield of Civilization to prevent them declaring wars from one another and create this grand alliance against the end of the world. This is lifted when the Warriors of Chaos are defeated, but, well, these factions were already inclined to fight alongside each other anyway. Why break this valuable peace when so much other terror exists in the world which we could crush together? This couldn't be further from the source material if it tried. I'd like to introduce you to the five Power Rangers that make up this ridiculous Megazord, and if any of them were the Red Ranger, it would totally be the Empire. Its fractured state should make it slim pickings for the Vampire Counts to carve up and assimilate, but... <laughs> Carl Franz here has a counteroffer. Hellstorm Rocket Battery! To the west, the High Elves can turn their island home of Ulthuan into a borderline unbreakable fortress. Not to mention their possession of the Sword of Cain, which, don't get me wrong, gives massive debuffs to holding your territory while you have it. But why should I be so concerned about meager rebellions when they fall beneath my sword just as easily as Nagaron's Kentucky Fried Fraud? But we can't say more without traveling east for a short diversion. Shoot! The dwarves were infamous as one of the biggest snowballers in the game, with indomitable fortresses, unmatched artillery, and unbreakable lines. A huge buff and rework for the greenskins was needed to counteract this, and even with everything that the orcs got, all it did was give the dwarves an even fight. They outnumber us, three to one. Then it is an even fight. Let's not forget Bretonia, who brought Arthurian knights to a gunpowder fight and still somehow managed to sweep despite their peasant economy being in the gutter. Or the lizardmen, who possess orbital lasers and motherfucking dinosaurs, yet may be the weakest of the famous five due to soloing most of two continents. The Skaven of some of the most advanced technology in the setting and can spring up pretty much anywhere under you, but if so much as a door-to-door -door sales skink comes to the Underhive, half their population scrams. The book saw the Empire drowning in swarms of Skaven slaves, and the moon blown apart by their warp seers, but what this game's world faces feels less like there's a vermintide and more of a... Yeah... The Order Tide was never the intended outcome for the Shield of Civilization, and completely antithetical to the whole reason Chaos's endgame crisis exists. Total Warhammer is meant to emulate the Warhammer world to the author's intentions, not contradict or defy it. Surely the oppressive dominance of good over evil isn't in the spirit of the setting, right? On a more pragmatic note, it isn't looked upon very kindly just for what it does to the game's balance and replayability. It makes the game predictable and very awkward to enjoy if the AI is always going to swarm you for being on the wrong side of the roster. But there are those few occasional games where you're braced for the coming storm. You'll be using the other factions around you to secure your survival, while stemming the flood of armies coming to put an end to your reign of terror. In these circumstances, it's hard to be the bad guy, and you are the bulwark against the gleaming storm. I find it welcomely subversive that you, as the wicked things that live in the dark, are the ones who have to fight your hardest to survive if you want to eventually conquer this grand, defiant world. And if you're one of the big Order factions? It's a power trip. One you have to fight bitterly to get started, of course, since you're at your most fragile while your empire is divided and your allies are at one another's throats. But when you get there, it can be beautiful to behold, like you're reclaiming the world from an era of strife. So long as no one's stealing your rightful cities, of course. Now, what's worth mentioning is how this affected the eventual release of Total Warhammer 3. There was a lot of chaos stuff added to that game, and threats are much more spread out across the world to make Ulthuan and the Empire much more dangerous places for the AI's early game. It even comes with its own in-baked alternatives to the Order Tide. 
New endgame crises include the dwarves banding together to exact revenge on anything that so much as looks at them funny, and there isn't a chaos endgame crisis in sight. I guess everyone got sick of Archeon. There were plans to have a crisis for every race, but I'm not sure how likely we'll be seeing them soon. Even so, I think this shows just how much of an impact the Order Tide had on the game. But I think it goes further than that. Total Warhammer 2 became a key example of why the Warhammer Fantasy IP was still strong enough to persist. It's a total accident of poetic defiance to the closure of fantasy, embodying the fans' will to keep Warhammer alive, and all it took was showing off the IP in its purest form upon Total War's framework, drawing in thousands of players new and old. And what speaks to me the most about this point was that Total Warhammer 3 was being developed to coincide with a planned release of Warhammer The Old World. And that says it all, really. There's a lot of speculation on whether or not Total Warhammer would have saved Warhammer Fantasy, and we sadly don't live in that timeline, but we do live in one where the success of this game, alongside the outcry from old fans, made it very apparent to Games Workshop that the market was still there. And, as far as I can say, long live the old world. I don't want to commend the Order Tide for its implementation, but rather its very existence. It's a remarkable reflection of the way fans saw the end times and what happened to their IP, like an avatar of all those desires to see the old world survive and thrive made manifest. One where the forces of good truly did prevail and prevented Archeon, Nagash, and Tyrion from destroying the world. Yes, Tyrion, uh, the Sword of Cain does shit to a motherfucker. And sure enough, that victory has been attained in both the game's meta and in the circumstances surrounding it. We're getting the old world back, in some capacity at least, and I genuinely believe that games like Vermintide and Total Warhammer demonstrated that the demand for these works is still very real. And that to me is kind of... beautiful, in a way. Even with balance patches and reworks, Total Warhammer, deliberately or not, says that it isn't the warlord who burns all they see to the ground that prevails, but rather those that will always wish to see the world built better and brighter than before. Also having good units for order resolve, that helps too. Thank you for watching! If you'd like to hear more of my thoughts on Total Warhammer as a whole, the latest episode of The List Goes On podcast is about exactly that, and is now available on my second channel. Or if you'd like to support me doing more stuff on YouTube, consider becoming a patron or channel member. I'm now doing Q&A segments at the end of my main videos, and here's the ones that I've been sent by this month's backers. What are some of your favourite sci-fi factions just in general? Honestly, I could say any of the big four from Star Wars was my favourite depending on the time of day. I like the Banish from Halo in concept, although I was initially put off by Halo Wars introducing them with Dude, they are so scary. They are led by the biggest monkey, and he is really smart and never loses, and, and, and they make the Covenant pee their pants. Other than that, uh... Exalt. How is the new life treating you? Do you feel like you've got time for yourself and family by the side? I'm living cheap but cheerful at the moment, and I'm definitely more flexible around friends and family than I was before. Which is nice. I just want to make sure I can still deliver good stuff on the channel as well. What started you on the road of plastic crack? <laughs> now I'm looking to answer this with a video soon. I've still got my notes from the old update video, and I'm thinking of putting out my little getting into Warhammer story from those. What is some candy or snack you may have enjoyed either in your childhood or just once, and then in horror found out you can no longer find them anywhere? The day I found out Celebrations tubs didn't have galaxy truffles in them anymore was the day I knew the economy was fucked. Any books or other media that you would say have shaped your current taste in fiction? Aside from the Dawn of War instruction manuals, that is. Listen, those instruction manuals were vital reading. Having thought on it, my taste in fiction tends to fit two camps. A. Science fiction which presents a competent but flawed organisation on the back foot where very genuine people within it struggle to make the world a better place. I was always fond of the Eric Nyland Halo novels for presenting their universe very plainly and letting me make my own judgments on whether or not Halsey was right to do what she did. And B. Fantasy stories which are full of fun, likeable characters who may be on a very serious quest, but the journey ends up being full of both whimsy and self-reflection. Weird one to choose as an example of this, but my gold standard has always been Avatar The Last Airbender. You ever wanted to see the Redwoods? Are we talking about the trees? Because I have seen some around Vancouver around 16 years ago. Those things are huge. I really want to go back to Canada someday. Assuming the last episode hadn't ended how it did, how would you have liked Kitten's story to end on Texas Beach? I want him to open a dual academy. What's your opinion on the Crucible mod for Dawn of War? Ah! That's another one for a video, I can't reveal my hand yet! Which videos have you had the most fun making, like getting gameplay or making skits and jokes? Uh, Chaos Rising and Retribution are up there, but Dark Crusade was probably the most fun retrospective to make so far. Everything clicked for me and it was a really smooth experience. Other than that, I hit some hurdles with the Decade of Reach video, but the final result was something I was very happy with. 
I want to write more scripts like that. Plus, the game night was fun. Thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video, whose link can be found in the video description. Thank you to all the patrons and channel members who have been supporting me, with an extra special thanks to my Baneblade tier subscribers. Adiros, Alexis Athena, Alistair Hodges, Carbon Green, Demon Xenomorph 1987, Diomedes Nuts, Gorgeous Freeman, Just a Guy, Obama, Old Man Jenkins, Potato Lord, Prime B1, Raziel Martellus 96, Reverends, Rogan, and Tainted Cookie.